So this will be our final lecture about ancient Egypt, and we're talking about the New Kingdom. You might have noticed we skipped the Middle Kingdom, and that's because, uh, unfortunately, this isn't an ancient Egyptian art class. Uh, so we do have more things that we're going to go on to. Uh, so the 18th and 19th dynasties were the height of the Egyptian empire. So you may be thinking in your head, wow, the pyramids are this amazing structure, uh, set of structures, and that was the most power that the Egyptian empire ever had. No, this is um, by far a more powerful state, the most powerful state that had ever existed in the history of the world up until this point. Uh, and Egypt had expanded well beyond its borders to the north and to the south. But um, you're seeing the picture, and it's a rather small sculpture. And the reason why I include this, uh, besides the fact, as you can see from the picture, that it's um, strikingly beautiful, is that um, this is one of the um, inspirations for me getting into uh, Egyptian art uh, when I was first thinking about whether or not I wanted to study art history. I'd gone to the Chicago Institute of Art, to see a show called The Pharaoh's the Sun, uh, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and Tutankhamun. Um, and when I got there, this piece was in a glass case by itself. And I was struck by the beauty of it, um, by the use of this unusual stone, uh, by how alive it seemed. Uh, you can see how the textures of the flesh um, are very realistic and then especially when you have this effect from the lips where they're slightly shiny compared to the rest of it um, just like they would be in real life people tend to lick their lips and have a little bit more shine uh, so the art from that particular period we're going to talk about which is called going to be called the uh, armarna period uh, is going to be quite different than what we see from other egyptian art and that's my main focus with the New Kingdom, is we're going to look at things that are outside of the norm of most of Egyptian history, and then we'll see one that is kind of the quintessential norm of, of the great power of the Egyptian empire at the end. Uh, so the first out-of-the-norm person we're going to talk about is Hatshepsut. This is our funerary temple. Uh, during the New Kingdom, uh, pharaohs figured out that maybe you shouldn't have these big um, man-made mountains that are just blinking signs, like I had said before, that say, say rob me. Uh, so their idea was is that they would get buried in the Valley of the Kings in these secret um, tombs that were cut into the rock, and then they were hidden after they were buried. Um, unfortunately, it didn't stop any of them from getting robbed. All of them were robbed, except one we'll talk about later on, uh, but that was the idea. So to make up for the lack of a memorial, uh, they had these funerary temples that people could visit. And Hatshepsut is one of the more interesting and unusual uh, and certainly influential, so we'll see when we get to later times. So the other thing that was different about Queen Hatshepsut is that as far as we know, uh, she was the only female pharaoh. Uh, and she succeeded her husband, Thutmose II. So a lot of times what happens is when a pharaoh dies, um, so sometimes the wife of the pharaoh, who would be usually at this point um, the king's mother, in other words, she would have already given birth to the next pharaoh. Uh, so it makes sense that sometimes she would rule as what's called a regent uh, because she is thought to be the second most important person uh, in, Egyptian, in ancient Egypt after the pharaoh. So that's what happened. Uh, Hatshepsut's um, husband, Tutmos II, died, and um, her son uh, was too young to ascend to, to the reign of Pharaoh. But what Hatshepsut did was, did was a little bit different. Uh, instead of ruling as regent, uh, she turned around and she said, I'm Pharaoh now. Now remember, when um, you say Pharaoh, that's exactly equivalent to the word king. So what she was saying is I am taking as a woman on what is thought to be this masculine role. Uh, I am king now. Uh, so as you can imagine, uh, some people were not uh, big fans of this. Uh, some of them for reasons that she's you know, perverting our history or whatever. Uh, but also just normal types of power struggles that elites would have 
um, and they wanted to use um, her being a woman as an excuse to get her out. Uh, but she convinced people. Um, some, sometimes she did it in the old-fashioned way by killing people uh, and um, was rather ruthless in um, enforcing her reign uh, and having everyone consider her to be king, uh, which is pretty normal for pharaohs to do. So um, she's a very interesting figure uh, in the comments in, in the description for this video. I'll post a book by Joyce Tildesley about Hatshepsut and about Nefertiti um, that you may find interesting uh, if you want to learn more about two really important women uh, in ancient Egypt. So the funerary temple is not where she's buried. It served as a place to worship the king, and she's the king. The king's patron deity at her death, a place to worship her. Uh, so as you can see, this place is done, and it's kind of integrated into the environment. Uh, there is a place where the mountains make a U-shape or a horseshoe shape, uh, and they kind of nestled this uh, multi-tiered structure into it. When you're looking at it, a lot of these, like the ramps uh, and the platforms, uh, they are original, um, but these columns right here are not original. Uh, and it was rather controversial uh, it was done um, about 20 years ago, and it was to stop uh, the structure from collapsing. Uh, and the structure is built out of rock that was already there, uh, but they put these in. But the reason why it was controversial is because some thought it was a way to um, spurn more tourism to this particular area uh, instead of uh, how to save the monument, and they were worried they may have um, irrevocably ruined uh, some of the archaeology that could be gained um, from this site. <clears throat> so generally what you see in art history uh, and archaeology is they don't want to mess with anything. If it's going to fall apart, you'll try to save it, but you generally don't want to do anything because in the future you might have better techniques for understanding history. So this is the way it would have looked when it was originally made. Uh, there would have been sphinxes that were lining the processional way that goes up to the ramps. Uh, and all of these sphinxes, each of them would be Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, over and over again. Uh, and in these ones, she's just portrayed in the standard way that masculine kings uh, would, be just, would be portrayed at this particular time. Um, obviously, the water is not there anymore. That would have had to have been maintained along with uh, the vegetation. Uh, so this is just to give you an idea of what the site looked like when it was originally made. Um, so this is Hatshepsut, and even though you might look at the face and see, hmm, that looks like kind of feminine or like a young man's face, uh, that was how men were portrayed at this particular period in the New Kingdom. Uh, so here she is portrayed exactly as if she was a male king. There's no difference between the portrayal of this and her husband and... Um, uh, many following pharaohs. Uh, this particular piece you can see along with the piece I showed you in the first slide if you ever go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York City. Uh, a lot of these pieces are in museums throughout the world and all of them were collected before 1920 and I'll kind of talk about why that is uh, and the possible implications that we could think about um, regarding that sort of thing. Um, so just a masculine king in this one but um, some artists were like, okay, uh, why don't we try to portray her as a feminine king? Uh, and what they would do is mix some of the conventions that they had for masculine kings uh, along with what they had for queens, uh, and they put those together. So in this one, we see Hatshepsut, uh, the only woman ever shown in Egyptian art wearing the Nimi's headdress. Um, but she's wearing um, feminine clothing, and her body is detailed. Uh, as women would be at the time. Uh, this is another one that's at the Met, if you're interested in seeing it, uh, out of um, granite, red granite, uh, so a very hard stone um, just for the pharaoh. So what I think is uh, interesting and more a reflection of our society than anything else uh, is that when you look up important women in history, oftentimes what you'll see is the sexy version of uh, this particular woman, and that's the case with this Hatshepsut picture. Uh, and I think that's what that tells you something about how women are considered, even when you think about someone who's the head of the greatest empire that ever existed in the history of the world, uh, we still see um, women like this fetishized as sex objects. Um, and 
again, that says something about um, how patriarchy is still functioning uh, in our modern society uh, rather than something about ancient Egypt. So the Amarna period is the strangest uh, and most unique of all the periods that we're going to study, uh, so or that we have studied. So during the 18th dynasty, the priests of Amun-Ra at Thebes, which was the southern capital, were very rich and powerful. Um, and this meant that they could be somewhat threatening. And um, dynamics like this happen throughout history. Uh, if you're running a kingdom or a powerful empire, you need a bunch of people to be able to administer it. You need allies, you need people that can do the business sort of thing. And in a lot of cultures, because of the importance of religions and priesthoods, uh, you would see people like monks or priests uh, who would be the ones that are actually running these things. Uh, so the problem would be if you're a person who wants to be an autocratic leader, and generally that's what pharaohs want to be, uh, this administration it could potentially get more power than you. And that's what the concern was uh, in the 18th dynasty. So the period name is from the modern name of the city where Amenhotep IV uh, moved his capital. Um, so Amenhotep IV uh, became Akhenaten. Uh, and he eliminated the worship of all other gods other than the Aten, and I'll explain who the Aten is in a moment, uh, especially Amun-Ra. He changed his name from Amenhotep to, which means Amun is content, to Akhenaten, which means servant of the Aten. And he had everyone uh, that was in the previous capital move to his new capital called Akhenaten, which means the horizon of the Aten. Uh, and so what... Uh, Akhenaten was attempting to do here is something that many leaders uh, throughout society, uh, throughout historical societies have tried to do uh, when they see threats to their power and they want to concentrate power on themselves. Um, and the best way to kind of look at this is um, the first thing uh, he tries to do is he sees the priest at Amun -Ra, um, of Amun-Ra at Thebes as a threat. Uh, they have too much power because of the way they are running things. Uh, they could possibly usurp what he wants to do. Um, so the first thing he wants to do is cut out their power. Uh, so changing the religion and outlawing the religion that they have uh, basically cuts out um, the justification they have for their power. And then the second thing that he did uh, with moving to capital uh, is best expressed by if you've ever seen the movie um, The Godfather, uh, or the, I think it might be in The Godfather 2, and the character Michael Corleone is describing how his father uh, had given him some really great advice. It was The Godfather 2. And the advice was, um, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Uh, and that's exactly what Akhenaten was doing with forcing everyone to move to this new capital. He takes the power that they would have um, in Thebes from people in the community or other alliances they had made. Um, and he says, you can't have that kind of support anymore. What you have to do is go to this capital and I'm going to build from scratch and be close to me if you want to share in the power of this empire. Uh, so exactly what um, they were talking about in The Godfather. And many autocratic rulers throughout time have attempted this sort of thing. So as you might imagine, um, people at the time were pretty pissed off about this, but since Akhenaten was a charismatic uh, and ruthless and powerful leader, uh, he was able to get away with it. Uh, but we'll talk about how um, he was considered in history afterwards, kind of similar to what we saw with Hatshepsut. So this is Akhenaten, and uh, this is originally part of a column in the shape of a pharaoh uh, in a temple in Karnak in Egypt. Uh, and this is one of those temples where like one pharaoh would build it and start it, and then other pharaohs would start and build on their own pieces. And that's what was done. So this thing is 13 feet high. It's, it's tremendous. Uh, the scale of it is, is huge. Um, and But when you're seeing the body, the body that we had seen previously, that interestingly, uh, in the discussion board, most of you had perceived to be a woman. Uh, and there is a lot of reason for that. Uh, so Akhenaten changed how the king was portrayed. What changes did he make? So 
when you talked about things in your first discussion, you already talked about some of the qualities that Akhenaten had um, that seemed to uh, show a feminine gender. Uh, so some of the qualities were the wide hips, uh, the very narrow waist, um, the kind of light figure compared to what we see, um, lightly built figure compared to what we see uh, in the earlier pharaohs where everybody looks like they're working out all the time. Um, and the belly, which looks like someone who was, had just been pregnant and just given birth. Um, and, you know, the kind of like softer features and long neck that we see. Um, so very unusual uh, ways that the pharaoh is portrayed here. Other things you'll notice, and it's especially um, noticeable when we see it in profile, is it almost looks like the face of the pharaoh is sliding off of his head. Uh, we have very unusual, unusually proportioned eyes, very long nose, very full lips that are sticking out from the face. Um, I think if you saw a person like this in real life, you'd kind of wonder if they were an actual human. Uh, but despite all this, um, there is a certain amount of beauty uh, in these particular figures. I think a lot of people find them quite beautiful. So the drooping belly and elongated face and neck, full hips, thin arms, wide hips, an egg-shaped head, uh, which is clearer when we see it in profile, especially when we're looking at um, his daughter right here. Um, and then it's more naturalistic. And again, what I mean by this is like softer, uh, in some ways, like more down to earth. So uh, what's up with that? Why did they make these types of changes? Um, and there's a lot of ideas about it. And some you may find on the internet um, saying that uh, Akhenaten had some sort of disease uh, like Marfan syndrome, which is a genetic disease. Uh, and if you look up Marfan, M-A-R-F-A-N uh, syndrome, uh, with Google image search, you'll find a lot of people that you could kind of understand. This does look like um, the way that Akhenaten is proportioned. There's very little muscle tone. They have lengthened limbs. Uh, their face tends to have uh, more prominent features and full lips. They have very long fingers. Uh, but it is a genetic condition. Uh, and in 2012, uh, Akhenaten and his family's mummies were tested. Uh, their DNA was sequenced, and they found that there's no Marfan syndrome uh, in the family. And that should make sense to you. Uh, pharaohs were never portrayed in a way that was a personal portrayal. Uh, pharaohs are also always portrayed in a way to show their role and to communicate messages. Uh, and that's the same case with Akhenaten. So why the change? Uh, and in this one with Akhenaten and his family, uh, you can see that things are very unusual in this particular picture um, before we get to the change. Uh, so the first thing is, is that instead of Amun-Ra, we have the Aten. That's what Amun-Ra is the sun god, uh, the god of the sun, but the Aten is the literal sun itself. Uh, so a different uh, way of thinking of the god. And um, the rays lead down. And at the end of the rays, we see the Ankh. So remember the Ankh is life force. So what you should read this is communicating is we have the sun god um, and he's, um, well, it's not really a he, <laughs> it's a genderless or all gender god um, holding these Ankhs to the noses of the Pharaoh and to the queen. Um, to show how the life force that is given to the Pharaoh uh, can then be, as we talked about before, given to everybody else. So another thing that's unusual about this picture is that the Pharaoh and Nefertiti, his wife, are doing normal everyday family things. Uh, and that is not something that anyone had ever portrayed uh, the royal elites as doing. Uh, you would see them, we had seen it before, you'd see them as very stiff and uh, as much larger than everybody else and not doing, they would never be doing things in time like a normal family does. But what we see here is just normal family stuff. Um, you know, kind of like smooching the babies, like uh, one baby on their knee. Um, all of this showing um, what you see during this period is that Akhenaten and Nefertiti showed them as bo themselves as gods as the pharaohs had, uh, but also as someone that is more down to earth uh, than previous, 
than previous pharaohs. Um, and you can have a, kind of understand why somebody would want to do this um, when you're making big changes that are angering pretty much every other elite. Uh, your other source of power is regular people. Um, so these types of arts may have been an attempt um, to kind of bring regular people into the fold. Another thing you'll notice is something that changes in the New Kingdom, people are allowed to have right and left feet, unlike the Old Kingdom. So why the change? Uh, we'll kind of look at this, it's very interesting. So this is the only time I'm ever going to cite any of my work. Uh, and even calling it my work, I think, is, is kind of uh, exaggerating because this is from my undergraduate thesis. And typical of undergraduate thesis is it's, it's not like any major um, work that moves things forward. Uh, so a lot of people believe what, what I believe in this one. So the ancient Memphite myth of the creator god is the story of the Adam. Adam rose self-created from the primeval waters of the creation myth. He masturbated and ejaculated a son and daughter. The son, Shu, was the god of the air who separated the earth and the sky. His twin sister, Tefnut, became the goddess of moisture. Since Adam was one form, he was androgynous and genderless, or all gendered is another way to think of it, the mother and father of all things. Aten combined the male and female forms in the same way as the Adam. Uh, so this is a pretty typical, uh, in most cultures, uh, a pretty typical type of creation story where the idea is that a masculine aspect and a feminine aspect is necessary uh, to create the world and to maintain the world. Um, if you're a follower of an Abrahamic religion, so Islam or um, Christianity, you may see some of those balances between uh, masculine and feminine, and you may also see like kind of a imbalance towards more masculine forms, uh, especially when it comes to creation. So also in the hymns of the Aten, and Aten, the hymns of the Aten was a po poem written about um, this new religion. Uh, the speaker refers to the Aten in his creator aspect by saying, hark to the chicken and egg, he who speaks in the shell. Um, the Aten is likened to an egg, which is a symbol of the origin of life. This might explain why the shape of the heads of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and especially their children are shaped like an egg. Uh, so if you read this image, we're seeing the Aten, um, who is related to the Adam, the mother and father of all things, giving life force to both of these figures. And both of these figures have equal masculine and feminine aspects to them. Um, so he's almost giving this like primordial creation energy to the Pharaoh and his wife. Uh, and they mirror those um, all gendered types of aspects. So if you're asking why do they both look the same, uh, even though they're masculine or feminine or very close to the same, um, that's why. So when you get in close, you can see the, the proportions are very unusual. Uh, you can see how long the neck is. Uh, the egg-shaped head, not actually aliens. <laughs> and people's heads weren't shaped like this at that time either. Uh, it's possible to make your skull shape like this if you form it as a baby, but the ancient Egyptians hadn't done that. Um, and you can see how, again, this is kind of a sweet scene uh, here going on. So this one is also typical of the art of this period where it's uh, much more naturalistic as in realistic, uh, closer to what you would see in real life, but still idealized. Uh, so when I show you this sculpture of Nefertiti from the front, you'll think, okay, this is a person that can exist in life. Um, but <laughs> realize that this isn't what Nefertiti looked like. Uh, this is an ex probably an extremely idealized form. Uh, so this particular piece, uh, again, was acquired before 1920, and I'll explain what that's all about. Um, and it's in the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. Uh, apparently for a while they had it displayed in a room by itself with all the lights off and this one in the middle. Uh, so um, a very striking piece when it was found, it was thought to be uh, an incredibly striking piece. So striking naturalism, and again, what I mean is it represents something more like real life, uh, not like the previous ones he had seen. Like I think if you saw um, <laughs> these people in real life, you kind of wonder if they were human or not. Um, but this one, she definitely looks human. Uh, during the reign of Akhenaten, Nefertiti rose in importance compared to earlier queens. And we didn't even see that visually in the previous picture in that she is uh, very close to the size of Akhenaten. Uh, and remember that idea of all genders, 
uh, is the justification for why she rose in importance. Uh, so both of these genders are important. So of course, Nefertiti um, would be nearly as important as Akhenaten. So we see it from the front. Yes, one of her fine eyes is missing and that's kind of creepy. Uh, but what I think is kind of interesting is to explore, I think uh, when I talk about this in class, um, I ask people, um, is she beautiful? Uh, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, yeah, isn't that obvious? Um, and the reason why I ask the question is because no, it's not obvious. Um, I think when people see this particular sculpture, they see a lot of contemporary in our society, standards of beauty. But these standards of beauty aren't universal uh, they aren't universal through time, and they're certainly not universal uh, through place. Um, but because there is a certain type of beauty standard um, that had developed um, in the 20th century and continues to today, uh, it became an international type of beauty standard. Um, so since we're not in class, I'll kind of uh, fill in some of the things that I think about it uh, and what most people say in class. I ask, why is she beautiful? Uh, and people say, um, she has this... Uh, small bridge to her nose and like kind of like a small nose. Uh, she has like full lips. Uh, she has like um, kind of a, a skin tone is glowing. Um, she has um, shaped eyebrows. You know, she didn't wake up like this. This takes some work to be able to have eyebrows like this. Uh, she has prominent cheekbones, a very long neck, um, a precise uh, and fine line to her chin. Um, and her face is extremely symmetrical. Um, so you can even like kind of put it into her crown where the um, line of her cheekbone leads into the lines of her crown. Um, so this particular type of look, including the eye makeup style, uh, might seem like you're seeing it and most of you are just like, yeah, she's just beautiful. Um, but this particular version of beauty is relatively recent, uh, developing um, in the last hundred years or so. And part of the reason why is because um, with the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in the 1920s, which we'll talk about, uh, and even before that, there had been a trend towards uh, Egyptian uh, art uh, and even people dressing up in Egyptian styles and using Egyptian makeup styles uh, beginning in the 1920s in the Western world. Um, and but the other reason why we might see her so beautiful, and again, this might be the influence from literally the sculpture itself, is that in the 1930s uh, and continuing as in the 1940s, um, there was a style that was developed for Hollywood actresses, um, so in the United States. And the style was developed um, partially from the, um, the creativity um, of Max Factor, uh, who was a makeup artist. And what he had done is he had created this kind of Hollywood look of a woman with um, prominent cheekbones and then her, her cheeks are kind of sunken in. Uh, she has these eyebrows that come to a graceful point and have a pretty high arch uh, and are relatively thin. Uh, and then again, probably influenced by this, literally this sculpture, um, an eye makeup style that continues um, away from the eye to make the eyes look more prominent. Um, and this became kind of the look of Hollywood uh, and the relatively um, extreme slimness of the figure became popular again around this time uh, and continued throughout the 20th century uh, to the point that there used to be these um, beauty contests, I don't know if they still have them, called Miss Universe. Uh, and they would have people from all over the world uh, and all of the people, all the women in this contest would have won a contest in their local countries. Uh, but what I thought was interesting until very recently, um, the women, they looked very similar. They looked like this. Uh, so despite coming from different countries and having different ethnicities, have different standards of beauty, uh, this kind of universalized standard um, from Hollywood and from international modeling was something that became the standard for everyone. Um, so the reason why I talk about this is that when you think of feminine beauty or masculine beauty or beauty in general, uh, these are cultural things. And just because coincidentally, and that's the case with this, um, a particular beauty standard matches um, modern beauty standards, it doesn't mean it's the only way of thinking of beauty. And we're going to think of, we're going to see many ways uh, throughout this class. 
So when I looked up Nefertiti, I found much better uh, and much more respect, respectful, uh, you know, kind of fan art of her. Uh, and I found this one particularly intriguing. Um, again, like Nefertiti in real life probably wasn't this beautiful, uh, but they're taking the sculpture from the previous slide uh, and imagining how she would look in real life. So how did all this end? Um, as you might imagine, the priests of Amun-Ra were really angered by what Akhenaten had done uh, and were just itching for him to die. Uh, they didn't execute him or anything like that or assassinate him, but they were waiting until he died uh, so they could go back to the way that everything was, where they had a lot of power. Uh, so Tutankhamun uh, succeeded, uh, who we now know as his father from DNA tests, um, Akhenaten. His name was originally Tutankhaten, uh, but it was changed to reflect a return of worship of Amun-Ra, so Tutankhamun. Uh, and when he rose to the throne, uh, he was only eight or nine years old, and he was very sickly. Uh, he wasn't very healthy. And there's a lot of ideas why that might be the case. It could be just a coincidence. He's just born as a sickly person. But also, um, the Egyptian pharaohs at this time had been inbreeding for generations. Uh, so we're seeing here uh, the throne of Tutankhamun, and Tutankhamun is portrayed just as his father would be. So you knew this was made early in his reign uh, with his wife, who is also his sister. Uh, and that was very common at the time. And um, royals have done this throughout the world. It was done uh, in England and Germany uh, in later times after the time of our class. Um, and the idea is to kind of keep the power in the family, but unfortunately, uh, that's not good for the health of your children and uh, over generations, uh, things tend to uh, break down. And so that may be the reason why Tutankhamun was so sickly. Either way, he didn't have enough power uh, and very quickly the priest of Amun-Ra uh, moved everything back to where it was uh, in Thebes. Uh, they basically forced this boy king to accept these changes um, and by the end of his reign, everything was back to the way it was. So uh, what happened is like the reason why we know so much about Tutankhamun uh, isn't because of the way that we usually know about pharaohs from ancient Egyptian history. Um, how we know about it is because we found his tomb and the same reason why we know about Akhenaten. So the reason he's so famous is because his tomb was discovered intact, not robbed by um, Howard Carter and others, many others, uh, in 1922. Almost all the tombs have been robbed, so Tuts was unique. Uh, the funerary mass we're seeing, which again is this kind of like young man, um, somewhat feminine, soft, beautiful face, uh, very common for the New Kingdom, fit directly over the mummy of Tutankhamun. And the mummy was nested in three coffins, uh, which were, had the same types of iconography that we see on this mask, um, with the big horse wings protecting uh, the king. And um, those three coffins were then nested in three wooden sarcophagi. Uh, so he's well protected inside of there. So what happened, the reason why um, nobody knew to look for his tomb is because there was an attempt after Akhenaten died, after Tutankhamun died, and as things receded in the past, to erase everything that Akhenaten had done. Uh, and since um, Tutankhamun uh, was associated with Akhenaten, even though he didn't have much power, uh, there was an attempt to erase his legacy as well. Uh, so that first column that we had seen uh, that had been taken out of the Karnak temple uh, and the things that, that Akhenaten had added to that temple were destroyed. Um, not completely, obviously, because we, we see some, but the idea was to take out his legacy. And then um, Pharaoh's... Um, Ancient Egyptian historians have been making king's lists for a long time, uh, and they took Tutankhamun and Akhenaten um, off the list of kings, so trying to literally erase themselves from history. So when those king's lists made, them so, made their way into um, the times of the ancient Greeks, uh, they didn't have Akhenaten and Tutankhamun on there. Um, so that was the same type of information that Carter and others were working with. So when he found this guy, uh, you know, they had to kind of look to Amarna, which had been a previous dig, um, to kind of understand what he was all about. So that's an advantage because no one knew to look for him, so uh, nobody robbed him. So I'm going to uh, post a video in the description that'll explain uh, mummification in a little bit more detail. 
Um, but what you're seeing here is a canopic jar. And since this is made for the Pharaoh, um, it looks exactly like his, um, his coffins. So the coffins, the nested coffins I was talking about, they would look exactly like this uh, with the horse wings going across uh, and the Shen rings, remember eternity right there. Um, and he's portrayed as Osiris, who is the god of the dead. Um, whenever the Pharaoh uh, goes to the underworld, he dies like Osiris and is wrapped up like a mummy. So what these canopic jars would be used for would be the organs. They're, they're relatively small. You can see 14 and 3 fourths inches high of the Pharaoh. Um, so that has to do with the, um, the mummification process and the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. So Egyptian mummies were prepared in a long and involved process. The body was dried out with special salts called natron, uh, and all the organs were removed except for the heart. Uh, the reason why they didn't remove the heart uh, or they put it back in the body after mummifying it, is the ancient Egyptians believed that the soul, so the ka for the king, was located in the heart. And that was a belief that actually con continued through Western and Christian cultures uh, until at least the 16th century. Um, it was the official position of the Catholic Church, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. And um, it wasn't until the 16th and 17th centuries when um, people started to study anatomy a little bit better and realized, hmm, the important thing that's kind of running the body is probably the brain, uh, you know? Uh, so um, people started to think of later as the soul being located in the brain. Uh, but for the ancient Egyptians, it was the heart, so they put it back in there. Uh, the body was stuffed with aromatic oils such as cedar, and wrap with linen. Uh, so cedar is a preservative and it smells good as well. Uh, the linen that the pharaoh would be wrapped in would be the finest, thinnest, uh, and multiple layered linen that, that you could use. Um, and oftentimes the king was wrapped with golden ox signs. Uh, so um, within the wrappings, you would see a bunch of ox signs and shen rings and things like that. So now I can tell you the story of how I encountered a mummy uh, if you get a chance to go to the DIA in the summer, and they're supposed to open up uh, on Friday, July 10th, if you get a chance to go there, you'll see that there is a mummy in there. And uh, when I go on field trips or previous classes, people would often ask, uh, is that an actual body? Yes, they have an x-ray to show you that it's an actual body. But whenever you see these, they're always under glass. Uh, and... Um, that's probably a good thing. You don't want to have like dead bodies kind of sitting out in the museum uh, without any sort of protection. But I did get to see a mummy without any sort of protection. Uh, when I was taking classes, an Egyptian art history class um, at the University of Toledo. And uh, the University of Toledo has their art classes at what's called the CVA, the Center for Visual Arts, which is right next to the Toledo Museum. If you're ever down in Toledo, check it out. It's really great for a mid-size museum. Um, and the mummies that they had, they were um, restoring the coffins that they had. Um, a little side note, the coffins they had were not actually associated with the bodies that they had. Um, and the reason why is because of um, the way that Egyptian artifacts were uh, acquired um, by people in the West. So this is a good uh, way to kind of get back to this idea of what happened in 1920. So um, as you're probably aware, World War I lasts from 1914 until 1918. Uh, and during, um, before the war, uh, the Ottoman Empire, which was based in what's modern day Turkey, uh, had ruled much of the Middle East. Um, but since the Ottoman Empire picked the wrong side, uh, they picked the side of the Germans and the Austrians, um, they uh, lost the war uh, and the Ottoman Empire was basically disbanded. So that enabled Egypt to become more independent. Um, they actually ended up being part of the British Empire of sorts, uh, but they were able to make some rules about the artifacts uh, that were in their country. And a few other countries have made the same rules. So after World War I, uh, they said, anything that is dug up in Egypt must stay in Egypt. Uh, and they built the Cairo Museum to house all of these artifacts. Uh, so everything that was um, to this day that is um, 
part of an archaeological dig in Egypt stays in Egypt and goes to the, to the Cairo Museum and can't be sold anywhere around the world. It's illegal. Uh, and they will literally chase you all around the world if you try to steal something and take it out of the country. Um, so what about those things that I said where it's a metropolitan museum of art? So before this time, uh, Westerners, especially from the UK, which had the world's largest empire at that time, um, and France, uh, went into Egypt and just took what they wanted. Uh, and since um, a lot of people in Egypt were poor, uh, and there's tons of stuff to dig up in Egypt, um, just modern everyday, you know, everyday kind of Egyptians would dig a hole in the ground. Uh, and if you knew where to dig, you'd be able to find something. Um, so how this, the um, coffins and mummies were acquired for the Toledo Museum of Art was by the Libbies, who are these owners of a wealthy glass company that did the endowment for the Toledo Museum. Uh, they, like a lot of other wealthy Westerners, traveled to Egypt and they saw people with um, set up on streets and on roads. And it was basically like, you know, in the summer, you'll go and buy corn from somebody on the side of the road. It was the same thing, except they were selling things like mummies and coffins. Uh, so um, what people would do uh, is they would often, um, you know, cut things into pieces or if they found a mummy and the coffin was like in really bad shape, they just put it in another coffin that looked good. Um, and that's because they're trying to sell to these Westerners, you know, um, and for good reason, you know, they want to make some good money. Um, I'm not blaming them for doing what they did. And these types of uh, dynamics um, made it uh, very difficult. You have people who are poor or even desperate in Egypt and they just want to make a good living. Uh, and then you have Westerners who are willing to pay through the teeth to be able to, to have these sorts of things. Um, and what it resulted in is basically a extension of the imperialism of the United States and Europe uh, into these artifacts where things are just like the uh, imperialism takes out resources, it takes out art as well and spreads it throughout the world. So that's something to think about when you go into museums, uh, especially when you're looking at things from Africa, Asia, uh, the Middle East. Um, especially if you're to go to the London Museum or most of the museums in the United States, uh, a lot of these are the result of Western imperialism. Uh, and if you start to think of the uh, museums as not just museums of beautiful things, but in the non-Western sections as collections of imperial beauty, which is literally what a lot of it is, um, it might make you think differently about museums. So we're gonna go over this idea again when we talk about ancient Greek art and what it means for a country's history and artifacts to be literally taken out of the country and no longer under their control. Um, so anyway, so back to my, my encounter with the mummy. Um, so while they were restoring these uh, coffins, they just like put the mummies on a couple of gurneys and push them in the back. And since we were taking this class, um, we were able to go in the back and I saw the mummy on the gurneys and I was standing um, just a couple feet away from them. Uh, you know, we couldn't touch them, uh, but you know, we could like stand next to them. We could actually smell them. And some of you might be saying, Ooh, oh my gosh, they're so gross. It's a 3000 year old body or a 2000 year old body, um, but they actually smell good. Uh, so remember the body was stuffed with aromatic oils such as cedar and rapid linen. Cedar, that's what it smelled like. As soon as you came in the room, you smell cedar oil. Um, and because of the process uh, where you're drying out all the water, you're not gonna have those awful smells that you would have otherwise. It's um, basically they turn them into human jerky. Um, so they would do this uh, with all the body parts uh, they would, um, basically your organs are very watery, uh, so they would take them out uh, and mummify them and put them in these canopic jars, um, including the brain. Uh, and when we saw the mummy um, in person, I remember I asked the, the woman that was working for the museum, I said, could you sign a flashlight up there so we could see <laughs> what's inside? And yeah, you know, there's, there's just a bunch of um, cedar chips inside of their, their heads. Uh, they didn't have anything in there. Um, another thing we noticed is that one of the mummies was partially unwrapped uh, and their hands was missing fingers, uh, were missing fingers. And we asked uh, why that was. Uh, and she said, because uh, there'd be shen rings uh, 
on the fingers of the mummies and it's easier to just cut the finger off uh, than to try to slide it off of the mummy itself and then sell the mummy separately. So pretty standard thing. Uh, you can make more money if you have separate pieces than if you sell things all together. Um, so uh, all of these body parts, um, the brain was one of them. Uh, the brain is very, very watery. Uh, it's, you didn't actually have to remove the skull to remove it. Um, all they had to do was kind of like break the bridge of the nose uh, and then get a hook on the brain and then you can kind of pour it out. Uh, those brains that you see in a vat, like in the old movies with the mad scientist, uh, those are treated so they stay together. Uh, if you were to cut your head off, the top of your skull off right now, your brain would just pour out and fall apart immediately. Uh, the only thing that's holding it together is our skull and a very thin membrane. Uh, so that's enough gross stuff, right? Uh, but I'll show a video where you'll get an idea on how these sorts of things are made. But this kind of shows you how important the bodies, uh, the little bodies of the pharaohs were um, for the afterlife. It's not just for their soul, but they need their bodies to be able to, to um, preserve their soul. So the last king we're going to look at is more typical, uh, and that's Ramses II. And this is his colossal rock-cut temple uh, in Nubia. So Nubia is um, today is part of southern Egypt and northern Sudan, uh, and people that call themselves Nubians uh, live in both Egypt and Sudan. Uh, Anwar Sadat, a previous uh, president of Egypt, was a Nubian. Um, and I think it's very interesting. Sometimes in this class, uh, students will ask, like, um, are the ancient Egyptians black? Um, and I'll say uh, one thing, like, well, you know, if, <laughs> if they approached a, a racist white person in America, um, they would certainly not be uh, welcomed. Uh, so they're definitely not white. Um, but another way of thinking of it is that race uh, for the ancient Egyptians didn't have a lot of meaning. But I think if you look up Nubians um, and see what they look like, you would say, yeah, a whole lot of Egyptians were black. Um, so I think that's the, the best answer I can give to that sort of question. So during the 18th and 19th dynasty, the Egyptians moved to the land of Nubia, which they called Kush uh, in present day Sudan. Uh, interesting, later on, the, the Kushites would take over Egypt and rule as pharaohs. Uh, this temple is dedicated to Amun-Ra, and originally it was cut into a mountain. And what we're seeing here are the original parts that were cut out of the mountain. It also displays the power of dominion that Ramses have over Nubia. Uh, so build something big and say, I control this place. I have sovereignty over this place, not the people who are originally here. But this is giving you an idea on how different uh, a typical pharaoh would be to Akhenaten. Remember, Akhenaten and Nefertiti and her children all shown on the same level. If you look at this picture, we have Ramses. Ramses partially missing. Ramses again, Ramses again. Uh, and then this is his wife and children right down here, these little tiny people. Um, in the next slide, I identify them, but it's not something you need to know for the test. It's just for, you know, if you're interested in knowing who his whole family is, uh, having an order from the left to the right. Uh, but that's more typical. The pharaoh would see himself and use this massive hierarchic scale to show himself as huge and powerful and everybody else is much lesser than himself. Um, so this thing, like the tombs of the time, was cut directly into the mountain and everything you see was originally a rock that was in the mountain, uh, including the inside. And um, this is a pretty typical way of creating a te temple in ancient Egypt. Uh, when we look at the religions of Christianity and Islam, we'll see that those religions were uh, basically equally practiced by everybody. Uh, they were kind of democratic in a way, and that God loves you uh, the same as he does a king or an emperor or whoever. Um, and that shows up in the practice of religion. You know, um, regular people can go to the same church that a king goes to. But in ancient Egypt, uh, religion was uh, more and more elite um, as it got closer to the pharaoh. Uh, and that's the way the temples were structured. So the outside, uh, you could see this, uh, but only certain elite people could enter um, the first level and the inside. And you can see um, Ramses portrayed over and over again as Osiris. And then um, each room would get smaller and smaller. And literally, like the floor would come up and the ceiling would come down you get smaller and smaller spaces that were more and more elite. So the final kind of chamber 
only the pharaoh and a high priest could go inside of there. Uh, and that's the way the religion was practiced in general. It wasn't democratic um, and people weren't considered to be loved equally or, or considered equally by the gods and that reflected in the, in the um, practice of the religion. Um, so interestingly, this one was also made in such a way so that when the sun came in uh, uh, during a certain time of year, um, it would go all the way to the back and give this kind of cool effect of connecting uh, this innermost chamber to the sun on the outside, so, so to Amun Ra. So in the 1960s, the temple was in danger of being flooded by an artificial lake created by the Aswan Dam. Uh, so the Aswan Dam was a plan that was long overdue uh, by the independent Egyptian government where they wanted to control the flooding of the Nile. Um, and it was necessary and, and people see it as a really good project in retrospect. When you make a dam, uh, you have to make a reservoir. And this reservoir, which is going to be located um, pretty high upstream in um, what's, what's now Sudan, um, and this uh, Aswan Dam uh, was going to create uh, what's called Lake Nasser, uh, and that was going to flood a lot of these Nubian pieces, uh, including a lot of Nubian churches, which were um, also saved. So um, people all around the world were like, <laughs> you know, we don't want this to get flooded because once it's underwater, it's going to be really hard to get it out. Uh, so teams from all over the world uh, came up with a plan on what to do with this, and what they did. Uh, and I'll try to find it. There's a couple of good videos, but sometimes they're not easily available, but I'll put one in the description. What they did, uh, and you can see it right here, is they took apart the stuff, which is once living rock. You know, they, they just carved this out of a mountain uh, and they cut it into pieces. And you can see the pieces here. Um, they're sometimes visible in the sculptures here. Uh, and they cut all of this. And remember, these things are like huge. This is like 40 some feet high. Uh, they cut it into pieces, uh, moved it um, to higher ground. They created um, all of this stuff is real and the interior as well uh, is original. And then they created this kind of like fake mountain with a giant concrete um, arch above it uh, to kind of hold it all there and then reassembled the thing and higher ground. And this project, like, it, it almost seems like it's, it would be impossible to do. Uh, li you're literally moving a mountain <laughs> uh, and the world's hardest jigsaw puzzle. Uh, but they did it and they did it, they were, they were expecting it to take uh, nine months and they did it in six. Uh, so it was kind of an amazing project and that's the reason why you can still see that today. Um, so Ramses II, uh, and the reason I kind of show you this, he ruled for um, about 70 years. His tomb has multiple very empty chambers. So if you think of the things that are found in Tutankhamun's tomb, his would have been, you know, 50, 100 times that, um, but, you know, it was all robbed. Um, and Ramses II, uh, I talked about the, how in the New Kingdom, the Egyptian Empire was probably the was the most powerful state that ever existed. I would say that Ramses II, um, at the time he was alive, was the most powerful person that had ever existed, a uh, singular person that ever existed up until that point. Um, and after this, uh, after the uh, 18th and 19th dynasties were done and the new kingdom fell, uh, it, Egypt never reached that power again. 